Now, I've given you, in what I've just said, an assessment, which started off with a list. But I have built it into something which I had written in another way, in a sort of a shattered kind of way, as you've been hearing it. But there were several points which are made there. Now, these points are extracted from virtually a list of the complaints which I have about, mostly about Western society. <laughs> in other words, you can't do this because of that, you ought to do something else. So we've now covered that. I do want to, just want to mention again in passing that a lot of this analysis of Western culture and so on is based on work which is almost as daunting as some of the stuff which you yourself do in your American universities. For example, in 12 years, we've collected about 240,000 letters of feedback from our various impacts on Western civilization. 70,000 of them from the United States. And the points which I've just given you, they are the ones which crop up again and again and again. If the people who wrote those letters and came and camped outside my house and telephoned and sent me, uh, you know, objectionable packages and so on, uh, and, and presents, had heard those or thought of those things or questioned their assumptions, they could have saved the postage on a quarter of a million <laughs> letters and perhaps even got an answer. If they could have written less letters and written more usefully, one could have answered them. I mean, I'd even attempt uh, a quarter of a million uh, replies. As it is, one doesn't you know, have to answer many of them, but we have built up a mosaic and out of those 240,000 letters, of which 70,000 are from the United States, we have found that after the first 1,500, no new queries appeared. There are only 1,500 queries that come in, as it were. And they are all referable to a structure of 27 different concepts, which in turn could be attenuated even further. So it isn't going to be very difficult, really, to get this stuff into people's minds if they want to know it. There's a large volume of input, but it doesn't amount to very much when it's broken down. We may have to deal with it very many different ways, but we've discovered that only three quarters of a million out of 35 million words written by people to us contained points which hadn't come up before. We were very interested, too, to find some ideas very commonplace to us, hardly ever represented at all. Some of them I have mentioned today. Now, I have to tell you, too, that we have engaged in extensive interactions with uh, scholars and all sorts of other people whom I call a control group. I mean, they are they always having control groups. Why shouldn't we have them as a control group? Uh, <laughs> in order to find out to what extent they are typical, to what extent the people who write to us are just nuts, as it were, well, we find there isn't very much difference. That uh, when you get... We, no, it isn't that the people who write to us are nuts than the scholars are, it is that the statistics show, whereas a lot of people will write to you because they write to anybody whose address they can get hold of, they aren't very numerous quantity-wise when you have a very large number of letters. So that's all right. It is very difficult, and it's always going to be quite difficult for all of us not to look for what we've been trained to look for in metaphysics or in anything else. But I have discovered something. That's what I call the cat and snore experiment, snoring, <laughs> cat and snore. Now, we played a recording of a cat's purr to random collections of people, and when they were told it was a human snore, this cat's purr, they disliked it and they turned away in disgust. And those who were informed that it was the purr of a contented cat, apart from those who disliked cats, expressed a, expressed a desire to hear more. Oh, let me hear that again. <laughs> right. Now, when snores were played, to an audience whose members have been told it was a kitten purring, they all expressed pleasure except the ones who didn't like cats. Now, we didn't stop at that. We've discovered that by telling people afterwards, by telling people what they'd done and playing the, all the stuff through again, their perception sharpened, as it were, and they were able to tell the snore from the par. If you told people before they heard it, they could tell. What it all boils down to, I don't want to go into this whole picture, is that it is true to say that we all interpret something according to expectation or according to what we are told to expect. But we have also discovered that if you tell a person that he or she may be able to extend his perceptions in a certain direction, he can do so, providing he isn't too neurotic or psychotic or excited or whatever. In other words, there is this kind of what I have called this pessimism characteristic here. And in order to advance in this sort of higher level perception thing, you have to establish with the person who is working with you 
a certain degree of harmony, understanding and mutual trust. And this may take a very long time. And this is one of the reasons why all this metaphysical teaching takes so long. I mean, if we set aside the fact that sometimes it's not genuine, but where it does take a long time is the development of the right grouping and harmony and understanding so that people aren't too excited, too afraid of their teacher or too high on pot or too low on <laughs> something else. There has to be, a, it, it's, it's an alignment thing and one has to find this alignment. One of the things which a experienced person in this line can do is to represent or communicate this alignment. Just like, you know, you take somebody's hand in yours or they know how to behave under certain circumstances by how you behave with them. I mean, the social thing, I remember I took my much respected friend, Dr. Ornstein, to the home of some of my Afghan compatriots in New Jersey. And he soon learned that you have to bow about 27 times before you can go through the door. After you know, after you yes. And, I mean, he picked up the, the thing and he was deriving considerable spiritual benefits from it by the time, by the time of it. So these things can be learned, you see. So if Sufism, as people keep on saying, is it, what is it, is it a teaching, is it a religion, is it a road? If it's a road, this is the curve on it, the camber. That's to say, the road is there, it's very easy to follow, but there are bumps and there are curves and so on. And in order to conduct oneself, let alone anybody else along this road, it is necessary to know about the bumps and curves. Now, they are not to be ironed out by, by I nearly said by means of a blunderbuss, but I think oh, that's a redundancy, not to be ironed out by a blunderbuss methods, by saying, look, what you want is humility, so we're going to be so humble that you never look how humble I am, I'm so humble, my God. No, it, it doesn't, it's no good. That is circus. That is where spirituality becomes circus. I mean, there is such a thing as water becoming steam or, or ice. Similarly, we have a continuum of human feelings and human electronics, as it were, between the higher and the lower, as it were, and what is spiritual, as it were, at one level, is, is sheer emotional at another. It's coarse to fine. Now, you try to overrun the coarse, it doesn't necessarily produce the fine. On the other hand, I do admit you sometimes have to... Uh, I spent a lot of time in oil well countries lately, and so I, these analogies spring to mind. You have to burn off the gas, the head of gas, before you can get at that gasoline, and that might be wasted, and it might be if you fly over the Gulf, the Arabian Gulf or Persian Gulf, there are two names for it. I don't mind which it is. If you fly over there, you see these giant beacons, these big orange things in the night, and they're going, fuff, fuff, fuff. that's gas, millions of cubic feet of gas going up, being burnt. It's no doubt. They say that that was the origin of the Zoroastrian religion, and or at least of its fire worship adaptation. Look at the effect that can have on people. Look how much the burning off of gas can seem important, can seem central, can seem significant, religious, supernatural. Even now, as I say, when I pass them sometimes in a plane, I get that feeling, boo. But I, I do, even although I know it's gas, same with the human being, he may have to wear off some of his uh, emotional energy in order to get to a spiritual stage. If he thinks that he will get to it by means of that, however, then he's got to go to some other kind of firm to, to find a support for that. A London journalist, lady journalist, telephoned the United States Embassy Information Department to ask that the Gettysburg Address be quoted to her in full. That happened in May 1973. She reported that the information officer there pondered, and then he said, the Gettysburg Address, now is that a public office or a private residence? <laughs> no, United States Embassy. Well, then I will give you one of the possible interpretations of this. Those fellows in Grosvenor Square there with that darn red eagle, which is your embassy, they've gone native, haven't they? <laughs> now, I don't want to come here and go native in respect to the materials which um, are equivalent, if not equivalent to, at least analogous to the Gettysburg Address. Now, I hope you get my point. I want to try and give you something which is real. I don't want to give you a corn pone version, a hamburger version of it. It isn't easily done. Right, now how has the situation come about? I've told you and you can guess most of the ways in which the situation has come about. The ways which we, I haven't told you yet include this, that Sufi knowledge is cultivated and Sufi activity in various sorts of departments. It isn't this monolith, you come in here, this factory, you come in here and you go out as Sufi. 
uh, raw milk, sausage factory or something. Sufis have an enormous range of activities. Most of them are none of your business. None of your business, and never will be any of your business. But that which might be your business, or some of your business, are also split up into what are called traditionally the tariqah, the path, or the training system, or the school, right? There's the tariqah, tariqah sufiya, that's what the thing is called in Arab. You know, two people are sitting at the campfire, two thousands of people who are, think they're whirling dervishes. Some of these people are genuine and others are deluded. They are not easily to be differentiated one from the other, but this is one of the forms. Now, that's what I will call, and has been called, that studies in Sufism, as when you are in a Sufi school. Because in the West, some kind of a hallucination has grown up that there is this mystical school, and all school, an ashram is a school, and then in the Middle Ages, of course, we had the monastic schools, and so on. There's a certain archetypal, except that it isn't an archetype, there's a certain hallucinated idea of this school, which is what the people in the West are, are yearning for, not what there ever was, as far as we've been able to determine. However, there is that teaching institution which is called the Tariqa and which is the studies in Sufism. Then there are all sorts of other institutions and activities run by Sufis for peripheral or ancillary purposes in which I would call studies of Sufism. I'm giving you some studies of Sufism now. That is the information component, the cultural liaison, the uh, all right, the choreography of the Sufi dance. Big deal. That's what that is. Okay. Now these two, of course, when they're confused, let alone when they deteriorate, <laughs> you see what you get. You get what you, people talk about here now and are trying to import in rather great quantities in which I am trying to detoxicate you against or intoxicate you against. Then there are activities which a Sufi will carry on which may be called studies for Sufism. Now when I say to you, I am very anxious that people should understand conditioning, brainwashing, the two brain thing, the this and that, then I am saying this is studies for Sufism, because it leads towards it. It isn't in Sufism, it's not of it, but it is for it. So we work on all those sorts of lines. Some of them are none of your business, but sometimes they get confused. For example, if I am anxious to promote various interests, kind of interest, kind of knowledge, so that people's minds shall become more wide-ranging, more free to think and so on. I don't really want everybody necessarily to know that because they tend to misinterpret it. They say, ah, now, he is promoting a course in Aristotelian logic, which means that's what we've got to study. Well, it's not. It means that I see there's a lack of that somewhere. And as a human service and a study for Sufism, as it were, and to restore that component to your culture, I sponsor that. But that might be the last thing that you need. There are these different components. And when I'm talking here, I get the eerie feeling of talking in a language, or not, of course, to an audience, but I mean, I might be, in a language not very well fitted to deal with this sort of varied operation. It would be very easy to stand up here and say, all you have to do is eat vegetables, chant mantrams, jump up and down, come to my ashram, I will teach you everything, shun so-and-so, or love the whole world, give me fifty dollars. That's the easiest thing to do in the world, and that's why it's been done since the year dot. But it is not what we are doing. Even when I have put in some of the books I have published dummy chapters, chapters with exaggerated and hysterical interpretations of things, wallowing in emotion, those are the ones that draw the fan mail from the religious people from bishop and cardinal down and to the ordinary. Those are the ones that people recognize as real. It's the old story of the snore and the cat purring again. I wouldn't say that we deny the, the spirituality of people who think they're spiritual, but we're getting very close to doing that, you know. Don't ever put yourself in a position of being tested for spirituality, or uh, where there is a possibility that such a test could show that you were really just as nutty as a fruitcake, or, even worse, a hypocrite, and an emotional one at that, an emotional indulger. Don't put yourself in that position because you might not like what you find. I've put all this in diagrams and a lot more, but I have none of the diagrams with me, and I think I have described it. Now, we have certain definite progress to report. We have discovered that.
the people who insisted formally on one's dealing with something sequentially will now accept it when it's uh, presented holistically and can do something with it. As late as 1964, I found that couldn't be done. I have lots of reviews here that I'm not going to read you, quotations from really distinguished people reviewing my work in 64 who couldn't understand it at all. And ever since it's been discovered what it really means, apparently they are breaking their legs to explain that they knew all along. But, you know, we have this fantastically distinguished people. They shouldn't really have reviewed the work of a non-entity to begin with, but it's because they were generous enough to do so, even although they often panned it and didn't understand it, that I, we are now prepared to be... Uh, generous. I won't quote them. Now I'm going to give you something I have translated from Al-Ghazali about teaching and learning among the Sufis so that you can get somebody else's version rather than me, as it were. I'll show you what I have uh, the duties of the, of the teacher and the qualities and characteristics of the teacher. Now, what is a Sufi, Ghazali says? He says that Sufis have three unusual capacities which are worth looking out for although they're not logically relatable to what they are apparently talking about. And the number one is they have a power of extra perception consciously extended. They can see things and perceive things other people can't. Although it's not essential for them so to do and they don't always have it, but this is one of their peculiarities. As he explains, there's no reason why this should be so. And I think that's something very well worth noting because one would have thought that a person living nearly a thousand years ago would have said anything connected with spiritual things must be associated with uh, extrasensory perception or something. But I'm glad to see he says that. The other ability is they may or may not have, and probably do, the ability to move objects of themselves, as it were, without being able to exercise normal pressure on them. And the third baffling capacity is to obtain through direct awareness knowledge which is otherwise obtained either by personal visits or great pains and labor and trouble. Otherwise they have a direct ability to soak up certain things. These are three of their peculiarities according to him. All right, now he says the important quality of the teacher is that he shall not and cannot withhold any advice needed by the student, but neither must he allow him to try to reach any stage until he is able to master it and has mastered the ones which came before. He must not allow anybody to attempt something intricate until that person has perceived and understood the simple things which precede it. If he does not do this, he is not a teacher. Now, of course, it's very difficult to be a teacher under these circumstances because most people want to learn to behave like the man who took the prayer book back to the bookstore because it didn't work first time. But Ghazali continues that this teacher must, in order to be a teacher, he must make sure that the student realizes that our kind of knowledge cannot coexist with competitiveness in respect to it. In other words, you can be as competitive as you like, but you cannot be in a competitive mode, shall we call it, of your mind when you're studying this stuff. Or You can't do it. If you boast, if you have a desire for power, these will inhibit the development of this understanding. Right? Sufis do not believe that knowledge and teaching are the greatest things on earth. In that they differ from everybody else. They believe that the greatest thing on earth is the protection and correct use of knowledge, not the knowledge itself. The operation of teachership, however, is so important and so vital that a learned man who does not act and cannot put his knowledge into practice is effectively, in our eyes, an ignoramus. No. That's something about what the teacher is like. We don't find metaphysical teachers or spiritual teachers or profane teachers like that, actually. So our kind of teacher is a different kind of animal. Right? Now what about the student? All right, he says, there are ten duties of the student or characteristics of the student. Number one is that this student must make himself inwardly clean even if he thinks that this is a ridiculous idea. Now by that he means, of course, yeah, it, even then, a thousand years ago, 900 years ago, this idea of being clean and inwardly clean was a, a bit of a pose with a lot of people. 
But he has to bring you back to it. And he's talking to people who aren't, presumably, who aren't posars. And he's just saying, well, it may seem a crazy thing that the spiritual imitators do, but believe me, it has some validity, inwardly clean. It does not mean that he must be without anger, greed, or envy, but it means that he must be able to operate without the distorting effects of anger, greed, and envy, and so on. We are talking about a psychology which isn't known in these parts. If you ever meet Sufi teachers, quote-unquote, ask them about this, because this is what their grandfather, as it were, is saying about it. But those people who have anger, greed, and envy, and similar emotions, and regard them as human characteristics, should note that the Sufis regard them as pre-human. Now, the second duty is that you must have worldly interests. You must not detach yourself from things of this world, but these interests must occupy you only to the extent that they need to do so. The third duty is complete submission to the teacher or the teaching. But this, he says, is of course part of a contract of mutual and total respect. You cannot respect and submit completely to someone who does not submit to you and respect you completely. So again, this isn't really the sort of teacher that one is used to. And Al-Ghazali illustrates this with a famous uh, story about two people, one who treated the other one with respect and the other one treated him with respect, rather like Dr. Ornstein and I and our friends trying to get through a door in the house of Afghans where it's after you all the time. But at some point it isn't and it does go on. Now that was the third duty. The fourth duty is the student must not concern himself with apparent differences in formulation, presentation or opinion of various teachers. The student must follow and acquire the form in which the teaching is being offered to him by his teacher. So this isn't comparative religion at all. Oh, but we had dervish dancing at my last class. Oh. The fifth duty is that the student should familiarize himself with other areas of laudable knowledge apart from those in his own field. This is because knowledge is interrelated and what you learn about one kind of knowledge will hold good for another and also because there is a danger of bigotry and social conflict particularly between people of learning. That's the ordinary kind of learning. That would be quite useful in the universities I sometimes feel. Now, the sixth duty is that the student must study what he is following in its due order. If he is told that he must do something in a certain order and must not do something else, then he must do it. He must study in a certain succession. It is not denied, says our author, that Sufi knowledge is the most advanced knowledge. But this is mainly because it is different from mere repetition and from learning which involves, in whole or part, assuming beliefs handed down by one's predecessors. And this is true in religion as in anything else. The seventh duty of the student is he must not approach one part of a study before that which comes before it has been duly completed because each stage prepares for the next. I suppose you all know the story about the illiterate peasant who learned to read and somebody said to him after a few weeks, I, well, I suppose you're reading the Bible now. I said, that Bible? Good heavens, I passed that weeks ago. I'm on the horse racing results now. You see, you can overshoot the mark. That's another thing people don't understand in so-called spiritual studies. You over-excite yourself emotionally. Uh, you never get back, very often, can't get back. Members of certain cults that I do meet uh, have had their fuses blown. As it I mean, you know, they, they, as far as I'm concerned, they're done for. I mean, it's a terrible thing to say, but I mean, it can happen in the physical world, and here it is in another world. Now, the eighth duty is to have a proper respect for the relative ranking of various studies. That's to say, and this is a very important thing, that you mustn't think that your study is more important than somebody else's, but it must be sufficiently important to you. And again, those things which are not as important as what you are studying must nevertheless be treated with respect. However, most important are to be considered those studies which deal in human durability. It's a rather a nice phrase. The ninth duty is that the aim has got to be self-improvement and not visible power or influence and 
The aim must never be to excel in disputation. You must never be capable of showing that you despise externalist studies which are carried out by others, such as law, literature and religious observance. Those were the main studies going on at that time, of course. The tenth duty is you must find a way of understanding the connection between the various studies, the organic relationship between human learning, systems of various sorts or bodies of knowledge, so that you do not have to concentrate on relatively unimportant things which are highly esteemed at the expense of distant though significant ones. And what is really significant in human terms and relationships is of real importance to the student. And this, again, this is where he touches on what I was saying about you can develop a capacity to know what experiences to learn or to go into in order to understand things. Now I'm going to go very rapidly through something about the exercises that Sufis carry out and the concepts which surround them. There are all sorts of concepts among the Sufis. The first concept to think about is the one of station. And this is called maqam, a station. A station is a posture that somebody takes up. Your teacher may say, you must adopt the station of repentance. Now, repentance means you must turn back from, you must repent uh, your ways, or you must not do things, you must try not to do things which are compulsive. You must turn back, or turn back from temptations, or from overrunning, all kinds of things. That is the first station. He may have to stabilize himself on, say, repentance, and then his teacher will assign him another one. And there are a whole number of these. However, I'm just telling you that there is a station. A station is what is taken up successively in a posture, a way of behaving, a rule of life, something like that, taken up. There's a whole specific list of them at the behest of your teacher. He diagnoses you. He says, you need a little more humility or a little more solitude or a little more this or a little more that or a little less of this. And he prescribes these things for you, for your ordinary personality. That is a station. Now, a state is a state of altered consciousness. This is called hal. And that's something which comes upon people as a result of emotional and other activities, including religious fervor, a state of ecstasy or similar comes upon a person and that is also known as a gift. The main objective of Sufis experiencing these flashes, as they're called, is to get beyond them. States are like flashes of lightning. Their existence and permanence in a person are indications and proofs of the presence of the lower self. In other words, if you were transparent to this divine impulse as it's thought to be, you wouldn't register this vibration, pleasant or unpleasant, even divine feeling, you would acquire knowledge and perceptive delight which isn't uh, accompanied by physical and mental phenomena and symptoms of the kind often reported by mystics. Being in a station is regarded as a sort of bondage. That's to say, you're not regarded as free, you're regarded as accepting this kind of bondage from your teacher. And the purpose of the bondage being in the station, when you may receive the states, is to try and train your nafsi amara, your commanding self. Now your commanding, what is your commanding self? Is that the ego? Is that, well, I'll tell you what we call it and you can tell me what you call it. We say, this is the mixture. This is your personality as it really is now, from which we elicit reactions. So I stick a pin in you, you jump and you swear an oath or something. That's your commanding self. It's commanded you to do it. It's a mixture of your instinct or heredity and environment, of how you react to things because of how you're made and how you react to stimuli because of what you've learned and what you haven't learned. So a lot of us are juvenile and we have immature commanding selves. And the purpose of the Sufi enterprise in its um, technology, shall we call it, and procedures is to transform this commanding self. The first stage of the commanding self is when you're like we all are ordinarily, where we are a prey to anger or to excitement or to moods and when we we are in fact run by that self. There's nothing we can do about it except try to repent and try to feel conscience. And these are generally the first bits of training, this question of repentance and conscience, turning back, designed to start the commanding self 
in its improvement or purification. This is the stage which the Sufis reckon the Christians have arrived at in their training system, the publicly known part of the Christian training system which is generally represented as the Christian religion appears to the Sufis to be that where you are expected to stand aside from or transform or both that evil thing as it were which is a mixture of passions and learnt patterns. So in the Sufi scheme of things it appears to them that out of the five successive processes and the clarification of the self, this commanding self situation is probably the Christian position, at least as publicly taught, probably is where the commanding self is acted upon by reproach, self-reproach, and it then becomes what is called by the Sufis the second stage of the commanding self, the accusing self. So you're now in a stage of accusing yourself of terrible things, as it were, and then when that has happened, you get to the point where, where you have the inspired self. Now, it very often happens that at that point, when you've repented and accused yourself of terrible things, you get inspirations. This is where the howl comes in. That's to say, where well, the self hasn't been properly transformed, but because it is accusing itself, it's able to feel some more uh, benign influence, which people call ecstasy. So, this accusation and ecstasy supervene, but according to the Sufis, after that comes the tranquil self, when you no longer feel any physical or powerful mental reaction to higher perceptions. You know, you feel, you understand, but you don't jump about, you don't scream and shout, you don't feel blotted out by the infinite in, or anything like that. But it is a stage where you have greater understanding, as they say, this is where you get to what is called love, where you have an understanding of how true love is represented on earth by comparative love. And after the tranquil self is the satisfied self, which isn't quite the same. The Sufi then becomes satisfied. Well now, he isn't satisfied with being satisfied, because after that he be or she becomes satisfying, and that is the point at which the Sufi has to satisfy others. And is capable of it, and this is the stage where the teachership option comes in. And the last stage of this refinement is the completed self, as it's called. Or they call it sometimes the purified self, in which the situation has been arrived at, like the Sufis say, die before your death. Which means you must go through these stages before you're physically dead, because you'll have to go through them when you are physically dead. Well, why not go through them now, so that you may become that which you could become without further delay, as it were. That's the, the message, I think. Now, these are the stages of the self. How is this self worked on? Some people call the commanding self the depraved self, uh, by the way. It's the sinful person in theological terms. Some people call this self. I call it the self. Some people call it the soul. Now, I don't call it the soul because it is much more of a self, as understood in the West particularly, and because there's another word for soul. What happens if you carry out exercises designed, uh, exercises which are not of divine quality, but which are technically well-based, which are designed to produce uh, some of the concomitants of higher understanding. In other words, what happens if you provoke a mystical experience? Now, this to us is one of the most dangerous things to do, or to attempt. It produces a sort of spiritual vanity the delusion that you are a teacher, or that you are a this or that and the other, and people set up all sorts of cults based on it, and you, you couldn't even shake them with a lie detector. In other words, their egos have become congealed. Can't do much with them. I don't know what anybody could, but it's not my responsibility. Now, there's an example of, here is one, which happened not very long ago. I'll tell you more about the exercises in a minute, but this is an example of, of, of a product. I lived, or at least I was living in a house quite near to this chap, who was passing on messages from an invisible Sufi teacher. And I dropped in on his house one day and had a cup of tea with him, and I said, look, what is this invisible Sufi teacher whose representative you are? And he said, well, he doesn't really exist. And I said, well, uh, I mean, how can you do such a deception? How can you? And what kind of a person are you? And he said, well, no, I don't, don't do it. It's fate. I've been chosen for this. I said, you've been chosen to run a ramp? And he said, oh, yes. So I said, how? Well, 
Now, he says, I won't tell you who it is, but I once wrote to a holy dervish, whatever. I don't know what that means, but I suppose that's as opposed to an unholy dervish, whatever there. Rasputin, or I don't know. And asked him to come and visit me in this town, he said. And I announced the visit to my friends in the town. And the time and the date and everything. And I went there, sort of village hall, and I sat down, awaiting the great man. And the hall was full of people, and the man didn't turn up. He didn't come at all. But when we'd been waiting for several hours, one senior person in the town, village, which it really is, a few thousand inhabitants, anyway, what you call a village in those parts, he stood up and said, I have understood your meaning, I have divined your message. And I said, what do you mean, says this chap with the invisible Sufi teacher. And he says, the holy dervish has not come because there was not one, because you are to be his representative and we accept you. He said, that was the choice of fate, wasn't it? I mean, really, I, this man was only an instrument by some form of divine understanding I had been appointed. Now, what can you do in a case like this? The man is not certifiable. I mean, you couldn't, I mean, I'm much madder than he is and less plausible. If he came here, he would really go like a bomb. I mean, but... Is he a fraud? No. He's a man who's been carrying out spiritual exercises. At the risk of appearing to be a primitive oriental, I have to tell you that we do have in the Sufi persuasion specific exercises which are carried out by means of concentration on ten elements, five of which are relative and five of which are absolute, which are held to exist in the human body, like the chakras of yoga. The only difference between us and the yogis in that way, I think one of the main ones is that we do not say they actually exist. We say that if you adopt a certain sort of posture, the posture of concentrating on your solar plexus, this will cause your mind to work in a certain way. Whereas the yogis insist on the invisible channels which are physiologically present, but your microscopes aren't good enough, so you pay your money to take a pick on that. Now, so we have these five centers of spiritual perception. And they correspond to five different ranges of experience and they are conceived of as if they had physical locations in the human body. And the activation of these organs of spiritual perception, as they are called, is one of the Sufi specialties. Now, these five subtle locations don't exist literally and they are located in the body in order to get you to move in a certain way. When you are working on or seeking to transform this terrible commanding self, the secondary self, you have to concentrate on the lowest level of clearing one's capacities. You concentrate on your navel, that is where the secondary self is located. So this secondary self, although it's, it's extra to the five, you know, it is, but I'm just bringing it in here because that's its location, not literally, but that's where you think of when you are working on it. So, these are the five. On the left side here, we have what we call mind. This is the heart center, so-called. It is called in Arabic and Persian and cognate languages, Kalb, the heart. And concentrating on this side is concentrating on, as it were, a field. It is thought of as a field of force of some sort, which is either located here or by looking towards it inwardly, as if it were located here, you establish some kind of a harmony with its characteristics, the characteristics of the mind. On this side, you have the spirit, the opposite to the mind. The mind is, as it were, mechanical, and the spirit side is volatile. These are not centers of higher consciousness, they are centers of ordinary consciousness not properly awakened. The first stage of higher consciousness comes when you in some way combine these two in, in, a, in a posture of looking at this point where the first secret perceptive capacity is located and it's called secret. So whether that is the operation of the two sides of the brain together or whether it's something else of which they are a parable or equivalence, I leave it to you to judge. However, this is the secret one but this word secret, sir, Sir, or Asrar in Arabic, for those who, of you who know that language, is also called inner consciousness. Now, there is another one. After that has been activated, you then bring the power of the activation of this one and that one and that one together and transfer them here in the forehead, between the eyes and slightly above them, to activate this center of perception, which 
is called Khafi, the secret, only deeper secret than the last secret we had. This is something more profound, a more profound series of perceptions. Now finally, there is Khafi means secret, and Akhfa means more secret. There's a, an even more secret one, resident in the brain, and whose field of operation moves between the brain and the center of the chest, bringing together all these other perceptions in some peculiar way. Now this, I have to tell you, and you know I'm not a spooky character, this is true and this does work, and this is common, this doctrine to all the Sufi persuasions, and although I have no language to rationalize it in in English, no means of telling you what it is, I do assure you that the operation of these postures concentration on these points, other things being equal, I mean, you may get the secret teacher that I told you about, syndrome, if you're not careful, but other things being equal, do increase these perceptions. There's no doubt about it. That's why one finds it hard to sneer at the Hindu chakra system, which is evidently of a similar origin. Now, I also know that uh, although Sufis traditionally say this is where these places are, and this is what it does, what uh, forms of consciousness which you open up. They also say that it isn't possible to relate this fact to any cosmic equivalence. In, in other words, there is a discontinuity between this learning and any celestial a rationalization or explanation. In other words, even when you have realized certain developments through these exercises, you are not able to say, well, I can now explain it to you in terms of the cosmos because I've been there through that. There still remains a discontinuity. They're not Brahma's eyebrows or whatever you like, one of those things. It isn't possible. All it's possible to say is, this is the mechanism. It works. And that's a curious but characteristic thing about Sufis, where you do find certain sorts of techniques existing in the body of the material without theological rationales, necessarily. I have heard it said, of course, not by Sufis in a Muslim environment, I have heard it said that the Christian postures of crossing oneself is a mnemonic for this, and it's just a coincidence that it is the form of the cross, but this is a way of affirming the uh, existence of these of these centers, they do lie across a, a cruciform shape in the human body, but I mean, I don't know what truth there is in that, because you'd have to ask a Christian mystic. Now, colors, this is another funny thing, we don't believe that colors exist at all in any absolute form, we believe that colors are contaminations. Well, I mean, you can see what that means, in other words, a color comes into being because you've got something which vibrates according to a certain sort of vibration, produces a color. But on the other hand, feeding a color back, we have this, I won't say conviction, we have this certainty that the mind, that is the left-hand one, is in some way connected with whatever the color yellow is. Let's say if you think on or of or see the color yellow, it will tend to affect that center, that's the, the lowest one, the heart center, that the spirit center is red in some peculiar way. The one in between is white, transparent, and the mysterious one which is here is black. And the color green causes the whole thing to go, in other words, is the whole system to work and is therefore equated with the operation of the deeply hidden one which works in between the brain and these organs of perception. That's the, the way in which it works. Now, I am sorry to have to say, although I think I did already slightly, that um, imagining that one has knowledge because one has a description of an instrument is um, quite common to all cultures and it's uh, really not true in this case. I can only tell you we have this scheme, this schema, but I'm telling you it because it might be someday useful to you and also because we do say there are several forms of consciousness which have to be awakened. They have to be awakened in a certain order and they each have their own characteristics and they produce this kind of total effect on humanity and in turn, by their means, the, such a person as a Sufi who has developed these things produces an effect on humanity, uh, individually or collectively, both in the sacred and profane areas. That is the mechanism, although it has to be done under proper guidance.
There is an analogy for that. There's a story they tell in the East about two students who had an American geometry teacher and one is saying to the other, you know, I don't think this American, I this Yank, I don't think he's any good, you know, at geometry. I said, really? He said, oh, what is it? He says, well, this American teacher came up to me and he said, the square on the hypotenuse of a right angle triangle is equal to the sum of the squares on the other two sides. He said, yes. Well, I said, yes, says the student to this American. But he couldn't have been very sure of his facts because he said to me, now you prove it. <laughs> now, if you think, Ladies and gentlemen, you have been very patient with me, very, very patient. And I thank you for it. And if you think it's a bit difficult and takes a long time, just let me tell you one little story about it to illustrate it. The Sufi activity is a whole and it remains or becomes coherent when it's dealt with as a whole. It will never be coherent or effective, fragmented. So that's why, if you would have liked an easier ride on this, I would have loved to give it to you, but I can't. But the story is this about a man in a slow train, which had stopped for some reason, the hundredth time at a wayside station, and a man was quite impatient as he got out, and he ran up to where the driver was, you see, and he said, Can't you go any faster? Yes, said the driver. I can certainly go much faster, but you see, I am not allowed to leave the train. <laughs> And I'm not allowed to leave the train. <laughs>